the Raptor is a beast of a rocket engine. And it has a big role to play in the Starship program, but it's not constructed down in Starbase. So where is it built? Where is it tested? And how does Raptor make it from the factory into orbit? The life of a Raptor engine begins at SpaceX's headquarters in Hawthorne, California. This is also where the company builds the stages, fairings and Mergen engines for their Falcon 9 and heavy rockets. SpaceX learned a lot from designing, building and now reusing the Mergen engine, knowledge that helped shape Raptor's design. Raptor would not be here today without Mergen. SpaceX currently builds all of their Raptor engines, both the sea level and vacuum variants, in Hawthorne. They did start building a Raptor factory at their McGregor site in 2021, but NSF flyovers of the site haven't shown any activity since. The building seems to be mothballed for now, but it may be repurposed for future Raptor work. So starting off, how has Raptor's production evolved over time? Spoiler alert, it's come a long way. Early on in Raptor's history, SpaceX began prototyping the engine with a mix of 3D printed and forged sections. However, to speed up production, the company has moved to more traditional casting and forging techniques as the engines have entered mass production. In addition, to bring down the costs and manufacturing time, the company has worked to decrease overall part count and increase part commonality between different versions of Raptor. Part commonality essentially means how many identical parts are shared between different variants of a product. As you can imagine, the fewer unique parts that need to be made for each variant, the cheaper and faster production can be. The sea level and vacuum optimized variants of Raptor utilize the same power pack. The power pack is a large collection of pumps, valves, engine controllers, and other necessary hardware mounted above the nozzle. Since Raptor uses a full flow staged combustion cycle, the power pack is complicated. It has two multi stage turbo pumps and two pre burners. One pump and pre burner set handles the liquid methane, while the other handles the liquid oxygen. However, there are some differences between the two main variants of Raptor. Raptor vacuum engines do not have gimbal mounts as they're fixed in place, and in addition, the most obvious difference is the nozzle. This larger nozzle makes the engine more efficient in the vacuum of space. The exact reasoning is a bit too complex for this video's duration, but essentially as it exits the engine, the exhaust expands out more in the vacuum of space than at sea level. This requires a wider nozzle to better match that expansion. Fun fact, this version of the Raptor vacuum actually doesn't have the most efficient nozzle shape. For early Starship tests, SpaceX has implemented a lower expansion nozzle in order to make it possible to test the complete engine on the ground. Other vacuum engines such as the Mergen vacuum, J2X or the BE-3U need to remove their nozzle extension as the pressure of the atmosphere can cause instability and even failure of the nozzle when fired. Also, the fact that the Raptor vacuum's nozzle is regeneratively cooled would make having a detachable nozzle extension much more difficult. The sea level version of Raptor, meanwhile, has two of its own variants. The first is the Raptor Center, or RC. As you might expect, these engines are the centermost engines on both the Starship and Super Heavy Booster. The Raptor Center engines can gimbal, steering the vehicle. The other sea level variant is the Raptor Boost, or R Boost, 20 of which are mounted on the outer edge of Super Heavy. These cannot gimbal and are solely used for thrust. Originally, the Raptor Boosts were planned to be simpler engines, unable to throttle or restart in flight while having larger, more powerful turbo pumps. However, in the name of part commonality, these plans seem to have been shelved. Other than the inability to gimbal or restart in flight, they seem to be more or less identical to the Raptor sensors. Now, let's move on to how a Raptor is actually built. Like most other rocket engines, Raptor utilizes a regeneratively cooled nozzle, where liquid methane is pumped through small channels inside the nozzle, throat and combustion chamber. The nozzle walls, with the channels inside, are first shaped over a pre-made form to get the familiar rounded shape. Any coatings are then applied to the nozzle before being mated with the combustion chamber and power pack. Any external piping, electronics and sensors are then added. It's likely that minor testing is performed at this stage on engine electronics and pneumatics. And now we have a complete Raptor. When Raptor engines finish assembly and pass quality assurance, SpaceX ships them to their test facility in McGregor, Texas, which is about halfway between Dallas-Fort Worth and Austin. Raptors are transported on what has been nicknamed the Raptor Van, essentially a special truck trailer to protect them during their journey. At McGregor, each engine undergoes rigorous testing on one of their test stands. There are currently five Raptor test stands, two horizontal and three vertical. 
The tripod, one of the vertical stands, can even test engine gimbling. Its elevated position also means we get a great view over on McGregor Live. Like with all rocket engines, not every engine passes testing. Some Raptors fail, sometimes spectacularly. If needed, McGregor also hosts facilities to repair and inspect engines before and after testing. However, if all is good, the time comes to ship the engines to Starbase. From McGregor, the engines take the over seven hour drive south to Boca Chica, Texas. There, the engines are then prepped for flight. At Starbase, any final inspections take place and items like thrust vect control pistons are added to the gimbling Raptor engines. Currently, it is not uncommon for engines to sit in storage for a bit, awaiting their turn to be installed on the next vehicle. And when a ship or booster is finally ready, the Raptors are installed. This usually happens in one of the high bays, but it can occur outside on the launch pad or with the vehicle on a special stand, like what happened with Ship 26. In terms of engine counts, the booster gets 20 non-gimbaled Raptor boosts around the edge of the vehicle and 13 Raptor centers in the center. Meanwhile, a ship gets three Raptor centers, again in the center, and three non-gimbling Raptor vacuums. It has been suggested by Elon Musk many, many times that this may be up to six Raptor vacuums in the future to increase the vehicle thrust and therefore payload capacity to orbit. Once all engines are installed, the ship or booster is moved to the launch site for testing, accumulating with one or more static fires. For a static fire, some or all of the Raptor engines are ignited and burned for around three to five seconds as an all-up test of the vehicle and engine systems. This occurs at a low throttle setting to avoid severe launch pad damage. That is, of course, something which we have never seen before. Integrated flight test. Now, if all this testing goes according to plan, the vehicles are cleared for flight and stacked. On launch day, the booster's 33 Raptors ignite at low throttle. The computers check every system on each engine, ensuring that they are all responding properly. If everything looks good, the engines throttle up to flight power, lifting the vehicle off the pad. The 33 Raptor engines will burn on the booster for nearly three minutes, lofting the massive Starship up and out of Earth's atmosphere, but only to a fraction of the velocity needed to reach orbit. Starship's six engines ignite just prior to booster shutdown in an act that's called hot staging, ensuring that the ship's propellants are at the bottom of the tanks prior to separation. This is done because rocket engines need a stable intake of liquid propellants. Any gas intake could destabilize and destroy an engine, or worse, the entire vehicle. Following separation, the booster will perform a flip using its tank vent thrusters and reignite some of the center Raptor engines to boost back to the launch site. Just before it would impact the ground, the booster ignites just a handful of center Raptors, guiding it down to land on the chopsticks. Meanwhile, the ship continues its burn up to orbit, which will last around five minutes following stage step. Once in orbit, the engines are shut down and the payloads are deployed. To return to Earth, a number of Raptors will reignite to slow the ship down. We don't know officially how many engines this will take, but one gimbling sea level Raptor may just be enough. The ship then belly flops back into the atmosphere and performs the last minute flip maneuver by igniting all three sea level Raptors and closing the aft flaps. The vehicle then down selects to two Raptors when the vehicle is vertical. Think of this as shifting down a gear while you slow down to park. At last, the ship touches down under the power of these two engines. Much like the booster, the ship and its Raptors are ready to fly again, thanks to Raptors reusability. That is, of course, the entire point of this engine. Just like with the jet engines on a plane or even the engine in your car, SpaceX wants to start the Raptor multiple times with minimal refurbishment. As we've seen with Falcon 9, reusability drives up the cadence whilst driving down the cost. Thanks for watching and goodbye.